Hi, this is Chris Swank, and I'm here with Alexis Height, one of our newest MA graduates at Signum University. She's just finished her MA thesis, uh, Lovecraft in Beagle, Cosmic Fear in the Last Unicorn and Two Hearts. And we're gonna talk with uh, Lexi about her um, thesis. And if you have any questions, um, those of you who know our web interface, uh, go to webinar interface. You can go ahead and put questions in the questions box and I'll ask those of Lexi later. And um, otherwise, if you have never used this interface before, you should see a little uh, gray bar on the GoToWebinar software that says questions and you can just type that in and I'll get your questions and we'll read those out later. So, hey, how are you doing, Lexi? I'm good, how are you doing today? I'm great, I'm really good. Um, I'm very excited to be here with you. This has been a long road for you and I. We started talking about this years ago. Yes, we did. We did, so why don't you tell everybody um, the, the back of the book version of your thesis? Okay, so uh, I decided to work with uh, Peter Bagel's The Last Unicorn and the continuation short story that he penned sometime later called Two Parts. And in Beagle, I decided to examine fear. And to do this, I used H.P. Lovecraft's version of fear. So I had to look into cosmicism, which is from Lovecraft, and uh, define that based on uh, his works. And from there, I applied a Lovecraftian lens, as we termed it, to look at the monsters inside of Peter Beagle as opposed to uh, what you would normally see with a lot of big ones, a lot of people focus on the unicorn. I focused on uh, the harpy, Selenio, the Red Bull, and then in the short story, I focused on the Griffin, who is the monster in that story. So tell us how you used Lovecraft to look at Beagle. They seem to me to be, uh, when you first proposed this, two very different kinds of literature. So how did you, um, see this as a potential comparative analysis between Lovecraft and Beagle? Well, that was the big question. It was, how am I going to compare, you know, fantasy, uh, science fiction, or horror? And, which is why I went with the monsters and Beagle, as opposed to looking at the unicorn as a form of uh, monster. Uh, so Lovecraft had this idea of cosmicism, which, is the idea, and it actually comes from a quote that I used, and it's one of his more famous quotes, is the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. So I looked at Beagle as unknown, and the Red Bull, the Harvey Selenio, and the Griffin, they're all creatures that they're not fairy, but they are not mythology. They're, they're those forms that cross between the two, of uh, going in between the two different genres. So what about those are fearful? Why are we afraid of those? What makes those so fearful that it can actually affect characters throughout the stories? And what did you find out? more than I actually thought I was going to. I was pretty happy with it, actually. So, for example, the Red Bull, let's, we're gonna start with him. The Red Bull, as a lot of people know, in The Last Unicorn, he is never actually fully explained. You know, Schmendrick tells the unicorn stories. Molly Grew talks about stories. So there's no definition to him. There's no understanding. He is unknown. Even the unicorn makes the comment after she first encounters him that he's older than her and she's afraid of him because of that. There's no ending to him, but there's no beginning. There's just no explanation for him. So it was more of how do you explain something that's unknown? 
and where did that come into play? How did that affect what was happening? How did it affect the characters? And then Selenio uh, also considered a monster inside of The Last Unicorn. Selenio has a um, mythological background to her. So she's very human-like in her face. So she might not be considered as fearful. But then when you start looking into her, what she represents, who she is, what she's capable of. She's more than just a harpy that, you know, is scary. She's a representation of death inside a beagle. And she's very human characteristics, which makes her scarier because when you think human, especially in fantasy or in horror, you don't think human, you think monster. So she is actually one of those that goes between the two. Mm -hmm. That uncanniness that if it's too close to human, there's even that extra little, you know, creepy uh, feeling. Creepy that, yeah, right, that that you get. Um, And then your third uh, beagle monster was not from The Last Unicorn. It was from this uh, short story continuation, Two Hearts. Right. And the griffin, uh, he's never actually given more than just an I mean, they call it the griffin. He appears just one day out of the blue, out of nowhere, and he starts to feed on the town. And it's something that we had discussed that right now, the griffin originally started on the animals, the small animals of the town, and it has moved on to taking children. So he is a symbol of death for the children, which is unnatural. Children are supposed to die and and, uh, happily ever after. They're supposed to be kids and grow up and find their own happily ever after. Instead, this griffin is taking them and killing them and devouring them. Um, But the main character, as opposed to the griffin is, and it isn't the unicorn. This is where it turned interesting with Beagle. The main opposition of the griffin is actually a little girl named Suze. And she is the one that goes to the king. And it's Lear from the original story. And, and I, offhand, I do not remember her age. And that's terrible. She's not very old, though. She's, she's not very old. No, she's still very much a child. But one of her best friends gets taken by the griffin so she takes it upon herself to go get the king who has sent people to take care of it nobody's been able to get rid of it and um she travels with schmendrick and molly from the original story so the original characters do come back in and you can see how uh, they're pulled into the story but then the griffin actually has a moment with Suze where they look into each other's eyes and Suze actually sees and says at one point that she understands fear better and it's only after the unicorn frees her from the griffin stare that she feels she has overcome that fear. Yeah, you you wrote about how the griffin and the unicorn were kind of set up as in opposite opposition to one another, um, which is something that doesn't really happen in Lovecraft. There's no unicorn, no in Lovecraft, but no, there's no happy endings in Lovecraft. Right, right. Um, one really compelling argument that I thought you made with the griffin um, in in comparison to Lovecraft was how it isolated the village. And that was the same thing that a lot of Lovecraftian monsters also do. Um, and you looked at uh, three different Lovecraft short stories as sort of your um, control group, and then compared your three beagle monsters against those. And I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about how, um, how that isolation plays out in Lovecraft and then in Beagle. Okay, so with Lovecraft, and this is something because um, I took the class the first time it went through, 
uh, the Signum class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The yeah, with um, Dr. Sturgis. Dr. Sturgis, that's right. Uh, so when I was examining Lovecraft, I wanted to find what I consider to be similar ideas of what I was looking for. So I focused on the color out of space, the shadow out of time, and the shadow over in Smith. And in each instance of these stories, an isolation takes place. And it's not just one isolation. It's an isolation that starts off what you would think of as large. For example, in the color out of the space, it's the blasted heat, you know, in that whole area becomes isolated because of what happened with the meteorite coming in. And then it narrows down even further to the specific family, the gardeners who live mm -hmm. on the site of the meteor uh, where it landed. So isolation played a big part. And then um, with the shadow out of time, it happens to a character. And he's isolated because he's removed metaphysically through his body is taken over by one of the future beings and then the shadow of Insmith, the town actually has become hated by its neighbors because of the differences between all of them so everything narrows down to uh, w normally what would be one character and there are other additional characters like the gardeners it's a family family of five um but they focus in on uh, mr gardner who is the last of the family that you talk about and then the shadow at a time it's one specific professor who goes through this mm -hmm. although he eventually does get some backing from his family and then you have the shadow over in smith where it's the town but you find out that it was a captain who brought all of this in so Isolation became a big part, and that's like with the last unicorn. Yes, the unicorn becomes isolated, but how she becomes isolated because of the fear that happens, and um, what isolates her is what makes it fearful. The same thing with Suze. Suze has her family, and she's from the short story Two Hearts. She has her family, but she does this alone. So she arguably goes on her own hero's journey to find the king, to get the help that they need. And she in turn gets isolated by her main opposition at one point, but then she's pulled back from the brink. Yeah, and her whole town is isolated. I mean, I think that people have tried to get to them and not come back and it's and very... the king sent uh first he sent a knight and then he sent a i think it was a battalion and the town actually gave up at that point they just yeah, nobody they didn't, they didn't think back. they were ever yeah. going to get rid of it so they yeah. just accepted it and let it continue to happen even though they began losing their children yeah, and that's another commonality between that two hearts and uh, color out of space is you've got this group that is under the 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 tyranny sort of of the monster, and they just mm -hmm. sort of we can't we can't beat them. We gotta learn how to live with them. Yeah, the gardeners specifically, they uh, with the color out of the space. They once they became isolated on their farm, it's like they accepted that this thing was there and it was wreaking havoc on their lives. Even when it began to drive the mother insane and the children started to disappear, they just accepted it and they gave up on it. They were terrified, but they gave up. Right, like not everybody has the sword and can be a hero and, and try to take on the monster. Most of us don't. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got monsters that are indescribable and unknowable. We've got uh, the isolation um, of humans 
buy the monster from other uh, humans that might help them. What else did you pull from Lovecraft and apply to your beagle monsters? With Lovecraft, I'm gonna say um, the fact that they weren't, the monsters themselves, it was, we called them unknown. We do actually learn more about the monsters, but it's not something that actually can be defined. So when they talked about fear, it was something that was undefinable. There was no way to explain it. It had to have been an experience versus, well, word of mouth, let me tell you about it. It was just different from what was actually going on. So with Lovecraft, it was very mental. You know, it was, this is happening. They don't know what to do about it. But it continued to wreak havoc on them. And then for, uh, like, the Shadow Out of Time, the professor who is taken over, he picks back up when he returns exactly where he left off. So it's almost as like no time has passed between when he left and when he arrived. And then the shadow of Runesmith, the timing has just continued down through the lines. And it's something that um, the main character doesn't even seem to realize until he gets into his own history. And then all of a sudden it's, his whole demeanor changes as, and it's no longer terrifying. It's accepting, and he actually plans a way to help his family in going around this and becoming a part of it. So with Lovecraft, a lot of the characters have that sense of setting on the brink. So in Lovecraft, they either die from this insanity or they are able to step back and are thought to be insane, whereas in Beagle, most of the time the characters are able to be pulled away from it and are able to work around that so it's no longer hard that's like with Sue's the unicorn actually saves Sue's years by pulling her away from when she looked at the griffin's eyes Right, and with your two monsters from The Last Unicorn, the Red Bull and the Harpy, um, people are also saved from that. I'm thinking of Amalfia, which is the unicorn when she gets put into a human body. Um, she almost gives up with the Red Bull. I mean, they're down in that tunnel and she wants to quit and Schmendrick has to like give her the pep talk. And, and actually, uh, when I was examining the last unicorn, that was actually really interesting because Amalfi has been examined by other scholars uh, because she is considered the unicorn. But once I actually began looking at it, I actually considered Amalfi a, a different character as opposed to the unicorn. She was no longer the unicorn. Amalfi was human as opposed to the unicorn. They were, I don't want to say different ideas, different identities would probably be the best way to put it. They were still kind of one and the same. So Amalfia does, she, she gives up. She doesn't want to go on. She wants to stay with Lear. She wants to marry him. She wants to be with him. And it's Schmendrick who says, you know, if you do that, everything will change the world will change because the unicorns will be gone mm -hmm. and the red bull and as she says it the red bull doesn't care about humans but then oddly enough the red bull knows what she is she has become almost completely human at this point but she actually doesn't consider herself a unicorn anymore she considers herself human because she makes the decision that she would rather be human and stay with Lear. But the Red Bull recognizes her as a unicorn. She was able to fool him once and Schmender changed her, but she isn't able to fool him a second time when the Red Bull actually confronts her. 
And it isn't until she's confronted and she goes back to being a unicorn that she overcomes her fear because the Red Bull takes something from her that she wanted, even though she can no longer have it, which is, of course, Lear. Mm -hmm. Kate Neville um, comments that Amalthea and the unicorn are two natures and one person. Mm -hmm. Very biblical. Yes, and um, I, we had talked about doing something with that, and I did touch on the fact that, like I said, they were two different identities, kind of in the same body, even though it wasn't the same body. But um, I did try to stay away from uh, the religious aspect of it because there was that would have gone a lot further than and. Uh, anybody who's read Lovecraft or studied him understands that with Lovecraft, particularly, you'd want to try to stay away from the religious aspect of it. Kate Neville typed in that exact thing just as you were saying it. That's you guys are on the same wavelength. Yes. So, um, and and some uh, literary scholars have gone there with Beagle with with mm -hmm. religious. Um, as you were looking for, because the first step in doing um, the thesis is seeing what other scholarship is already out there to make sure that nobody's already written what you wanted to write. What kinds of things did you find and um, how does your research contribute to that conversation with, with some new information? Well, with Bagel, um, I was lucky because you have a lot of experience in finding articles that helped with that because surprisingly with Bagel, there wasn't as much out there as I had originally hoped for. Um, I did read uh, Jeffrey Reader's article, Two Sides of the Same Magic. It talks about mortality and immortality. Like I said, it was something on more the unicorn. Um, and it talks about the duality between um, Amalthea and the unicorn and then death and immortality between the two. So, I mean, that article was uh, pretty important um, because it does look at things from the unicorn's perspective, which was important when we were analyzing the fear side of it. Uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Parrish, he looked at fluid identity between the two, um, the immortal to the human, and then he specifically looked at the unicorn and Schmendrick. So that was very helpful. Um, his article was Stepping Down to Human. And then one article that, and it was one of the ones that you found, had found for me, it was uh, by Pennington. And he looked at Beagle through William Blake mm. and the cosmos that he had to mm -hmm. define fantasy. And he, he gets into how chaos must be present. Um, as a form of the unknown. So that article was um, was helpful as well. They weren't exactly what we were looking for because uh, we had both looked through anything dealing with fear. And what I had done is I had used Lovecraft and his idea of fear as a lens. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to compare Lovecraft with Bagel because they are separate. They're different genres, different ideas. But the idea of fear that he pre presents, the cosmic indifference as more than what you see, that that is what I was looking at. So how is this idea of a larger sense of fear and the unknown, how is that portrayed? Right. It's not like regular everyday fear where um, there's a spider in the other room and I don't want to go in there. It's, yes, that would be me. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's me. Where it's, I'll just wait until somebody else can take care of that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a heightened fear and Lovecraft had right. this great essay on, on supernatural fear, um, right, what you're calling story. cosmicism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Lovecraft's essay, um, Supernatural in uh, literature, and that's not the exact title. Supernatural horror and literature, or something like that. In literature, 
that his his essay was very helpful to me, um, particularly the first part of it, because later on through it, he gets into showing ideas and discussing how something that was written at that time was similar to what he was getting at or what he was talking about. So it was actually particularly the very beginning of the essay that actually talks about what he means when he means the cosmic and what that fear is and how that fear interacts and what it can do to characters as opposed to later on when he would talk about um, a, a similar author at the time writing things, some of the earlier authors of hard literature and how those mm -hmm. affected what he was writing and influences that he had used. So what are some of your conclusions then from this whole process? Would Can fantasy have Lovecraftian fear in it? And where does Beagle stack up in all of that? I actually, since doing this, and it's, I've been reading a lot of Lovecraft for the umpteenth time now. Um, I actually got the second one of Klinger's book to get the additional information on it. I actually liked the idea of crossing the boundaries between the two genres. And I actually think there should be more done between fantasy and sci-fi and horror. There's more, I think we can pull from literature if you look at something through a different lens. Mm -hmm. we, took, we took a Lovecraftian lens to look at fantasy. Well, could that be applied to, you know, Neil Gaiman, for example, because his books is all his books cross boundaries quite extensively. They do. they do. You know, between children's and adults and you know, fantasy, sci fi, mythology. I mean, he pulls from so many different things. So I actually would really like to look into more how Lovecraft might have influenced additional fantasy. Uh, Peter Beagle is still the one thing that I probably enjoyed the most. I'd actually like to go back, look at it further, maybe look at Fear Through the Unicorn next time. Um, and then Schmendrick would be another character. Fear Through Schmendrick, because as it was pointed out to me, uh, there are several short stories about Schmendrick mm -hmm. that even, you know, I wasn't aware of until it was pointed out to me and they're only you know seven eight pages but fear plays a large part on his side as well so in conclusion wise i think we need to do a little bit more with crossing boundaries and this is something that i picked up from uh, the modern fantasy class i took it was the very first class i took at Mythgard, and that is where I got it into my head of crossing boundaries. You know, where else can this be done? It's okay, you know, it's starting to look at the different things and playing with the different ideas. Fear just isn't in science and horror, it's in fantasy and it, more definition needs to be done on that. Yeah, you know, the, the whole idea of intersectionality is really hot in literature criticism right now. It's hot in a lot of fields, um, in, in political science and, and human culture and um, sociology. I'm getting a lot of, um, I'm a librarian, which is why I can find those articles for you. Um, but I'm getting a lot of questions from students and faculty about intersectionality and trying to um, not have such a narrow view anymore, but sort of expand that out and see what crosses over. And you're right at the forefront of of uh, doing all of that. So that was a really interesting concept. I wasn't at all sure where it was going to go. Right when we started this process, I'm like, I don't know what you're thinking, but it it seems to have um, really been a rich um, experience and come out with some really interesting conclusions. If you guys listening want to read Lexi's thesis, um, it will be, um, you have to be a Signum student to get access to our thesis um, vault, and it will be up there um, uh, as soon as it gets uploaded there. But um, 
I'm sure people could always contact you if they wanted to read it and, they, and then they can't get behind our, our firewall. Oh, yes. Anytime. Fantastic. All right. I've got more minutes. And if you guys have any questions that you would, would like um, to ask, and not necessarily about the con uh, content of the thesis, but even about the thesis process, what it's like at Signum, um, what kinds of classes that she took to get going for this, um, what kind of classes did you take to, to, like, you took an intersection of all sorts of classes to get to this point? Yes, I actually, when I started this, um, I knew I wanted to get into fantasy more because I had studied literature, you know, Shakespeare, medieval and the Renaissance, but I wanted to get into fantasy. So the modern fantasy class, like I said, it was the first class that I took. Peter Beagle was a speaker at the class and That's right. I was I was so happy when I took the class because there was so much more offered that I could see that I realized, you know, it's okay to be have more interest in this. And that's after meeting uh, Corey and talking to him, you know, it was, I was coming into the whole idea of, oh, okay, it's, a, it's all right, you know, to be have more interest in different things than just, okay, medieval renaissance or Victorian, you know, Fantasy was fantasy has been coming up um, as a genre that's now being, I think, more respected because there's so much more interesting in it going on. So I took a lot of the fantasy courses, uh, the folklore course I took, and that oh, yeah. was in um, with Demetri Femi on uh, Celtic literature, and we touched on children's literature there. We touched on mythology. We did a number of different books and it and i got to do looking at the and i got to examine the crossing the boundaries again on that and then uh, when the hp lovecraft course was offered i jumped because it was just one of those courses i was like i can't miss this um and then the hobbit course i found interesting and this is where i found the use of the text based on authors who do the annotated work that opened up new possibilities for me as well and more interesting things going on outside and looking specifically for authors and for example st joshi uh, he is the literary critic for hp lovecraft do i have to agree with everything he says no but do you want to read him to get more of an idea of what's going on, absolutely, because the man comes up with just amazing ideas and concepts that can be used to help, you know, focus more on what I wanted to get done and what I wanted to find out and explain. I have a lot of audience questions for you. Ready? Oh, yay. <laughs> All right, so Kate wants to know, which which came first for you? Was it Beagle or Lovecraft? Beagle. I, what, <laughs> this is before VHS tapes. I don't remember what they were called, a laser discs or something. They were huge. It looked like a record. Yeah, yeah. I had, we had those when um, I was a child, and my mother had gotten us that, along with The Hobbit. And that is where my fantasy started from and and then I wasn't allowed to watch scary stuff until I got older but I, well, I actually came into Lovecraft probably late I wish I'd come into it earlier but in high school but yeah Beagle was first and he, I he was one of the first fantasy books I read as a kid I started getting into my mother's books and she had a copy of it so that's where I picked up the last unicorn I actually didn't read The Last Unicorn until I came to Signum, which was well into my um, adulthood. Let's just leave it there. It's a fantastic book. I, and then I, I remember reading it as a kid. It was, I always said that with The Hobbit, my favorite scene was when Bilbo met the uh, dragon, Smog. Mm -hmm. 
but with the last unicorn, I always remembered the description that she had changed color from uh, a white to a sea foam. And that was always one of my favorite descriptions from the last unicorn. And it's in the first chapter. Yeah. All right. I have two questions from Sarah Brown. The first one I'm going to ask you is, what do you think is the most important argument that you make in your thesis? I'm going through my thesis in my head and I'm trying to do it quick for you. The most important argument that the unknown expands beyond science fiction and horror. It is in fantasy. It's even with things we know in fantasy, well, we think we know in fantasy, you still don't know. It's not something you're going to ever completely understand because it's not something I think we're ever meant to fully understand. Very good. And now, what advice would you give for other students who are approaching their thesis process? Oh, good heavens, plan it out. <laughs> really, and communication, it was definitely key. I struggled my second half of my thesis and it was because I was trying to read way, way too much as opposed to writing. So at some point you, you have to stop reading and start writing and you can't fall behind with that because that was a harsh lesson. I mean, I did it, but looking back at it now, it's just like, why, why did I try to read so much? You have to put it away at some point and you have to start writing. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been through this thesis process too, and I have to agree with you that you're looking at, uh, I think your thesis comes out at about 34 pages, 37, somewhere in there. Somewhere in there, yeah. And, and you start this process like, I've got to take a big bite of something if I'm going to write 35 pages on it. And then as you start to go, you realize that just this first thing that you start looking at, that's just this tiny little thing, um, you know, your thesis is probably twice as long as the short story, Two Hearts, because when you're analyzing something, you have to look at it from different things and, and put all your evidence out there. Um, and it ends up really taking up space. So I think you and I both learned that these theses don't have to be on the whole history of Peter Beagle. It can just be on, right, right this little bit. This and little and bit. that was one thing that I wish I had done differently. And it's something I would do differently now. Planning it out would have, I mean, we did, because we did, we planned it out, we thought it out. You know, I had my points, but I kept telling myself, no, you need more, you need more backing. and. Mm -hmm. And this was even after you and I had sat down and talked and we knew there wasn't a whole lot of Beagle articles out there. There, I'm not saying that they, there aren't any, but trying to find- Irrelevant, yeah. Relevant, yeah. what we were doing. And I was trying to make up for that. So that that's where I ran into an issue and I'm aware of it now. And if I could go back, I'd go kick my butt for it. But it, it was, good idea to plan it but you've got to stop planning at some point you've got to start writing analysis paralysis yes yeah well you can't go back yeah. that's not that's not a direction available to us but you can go forward do you want to keep oh, yes. going on with with this now that you've got the ma and you're done with the official program at signum what uh, what's next for you on researching I actually would really like to do additional research on Beagle and really get into some of his works. There, it's a, we, we did show that there are a number of articles out there, but I really think Beagle has more to give as opposed to what's there. And there are several people that I have found online that I have talked to um, specifically, there's a professor in Japan that I have reached out to, and he actually did an annotated copy of The Last Unicorn. Now, it's only available in Japanese, and I don't speak Japanese, and I can't read Japanese, but... <laughs> Takako is watching. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think she speaks Japanese. <laughs> so, um, 
yes, that's actually something I want to. And if I have to use Google Translate, I'll do it because I want to read it. I want to see what was said. Um, there's more to Beagle, I think, than people realize. And I don't think he's given the credit he should be. Although I'm a huge fan of his. So, I mean, and that's like Lovecraft. As much as I love Lovecraft, there's not everything I he says that I agree with him. But I think his what he offers is quite good. So here's my last question. It's from Brenton Dickinson. And Hi. yeah, you got one more question and then you're you're done. All right. <laughs> he says, Congratulations, Alexis. I think you're absolutely right that sometimes we need to step back and take a different look at things. I too have been playing with horror elements in non-horror fantasy, and I appreciate Lovecraft's supernatural horror and literature, and Stephen King's Dance Macabre. I look forward to reading your work. Horror studies is quite a large field. However, with hundreds of students, I'm struggling to break in. You may not be there yet on this one, but have you found any studies beyond Lovecraft that were helpful? Ugh, there, that window is always fun. Helpful in um, helping you think in this new frame. Did you look beyond Lovecraft? I actually tried to stay focused because I'm one of those people that if I get off topic, then I have a tendency to really go off topic bad. Um, so no, Chris was good enough to keep me on track because, <laughs> because um, I will do one of those things where I will continue to build out and build out and build out. And then I lose all sense of direction and I'm trying to talk about 10 different things at the same time. And that just doesn't yeah. work. The rabbit <laughs> our, warren, yeah. Yes, um, so I'm actually going to start looking. That's like, I did buy the second clinger book that came from um, the class with Lovecraft. We used the first one and the second one came out, I bought that. I am finding out that I do want to get further into horror literature. And it's something I'm going to continue to do. And I do have people on Facebook that I'm following. And I'm just like, when something comes up, I'm like, oh, ooh, write that down because that'll be useful later. So, no, I tried to stay pretty much on track because I have to. Well, good for you. You made it. That worked. Um, this long journey of yours, um, yeah. you've been with Signum since almost the very beginning, maybe the... Since the second semester. The second semester, yeah. Um, I the first one, yes. Yeah, uh, and, and, now, and now it's good. Oh, Takako says she's looking forward to reading your thesis and she might get a hold of that annotated copy, smiley face. Oh, yes, please, please email me if you do. I would love to get my hands on a copy. Right. Do you happen to know the name of the professor offhand? I do not know his name offhand. However, uh, he's on academia.edu. Did he did he, did he write the one on the Red Bull? He's written several things okay. on, yeah. on Beagle. And I have gone through his, the problem is getting it translated. Because yeah. I don't always yeah. translations. Yeah. Well, hopefully the, the thesis won't be too long in getting up in our um, thesis library, but um, folks can contact Lexi Height. You're getting applause from the audience, and and I have oh, to concur with that. And, thank you. Um, that's the last official thing that you have to do for the MA program. You're now graduated. It's exciting. <laughs> what am I going to do without my third? Now I guess I'll have to keep bugging no, no, everybody. No, no, no. You can come back and just <laughs> audit classes for the rest of your life. That's what a lot of us plan oh, on yeah. doing. So just keep coming back. Um, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure working with you and, and I'm really proud of you. So congratulations. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody. It's been fun. Thanks for tuning in and, and uh, um, we'll see you around.